Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another episode of Crazy Money. This is your host, Paul Ollinger, but you knew that. Today's a great day to be alive. It's a great day to be grateful to be alive, to be grateful to be healthy, to be grateful, even though you have to stay home, that you're staying home on your terms in a cozy place with Netflix and other things. Because a lot of people right now aren't staying home on their terms, and it's important to remember that as frustrating as our current situation might be. I've got a great interview for you today with a guy named Danny Werfel. My daughter is going to help us with his introduction because she stayed home from school today and we're looking for ways to engage her in non-screen time activities. Izzy Van, welcome to Crazy Money. Hello. Hi. Do you remember who the name of our guest is today? Danny Werfel. Correct. And what university did Danny Werfel attend and play football at? Florida Gator. He went to the University of Florida and he was, what position did he play? Quarterback. He was a quarterback. And what special prize did he win as quarterback? Heisman Trophy. He won the Heisman Trophy. You know why she knows this, folks? Because she's listened to me do about 15 different takes of this introduction and I keep messing up. So over time, she picks up a little data. Anyway, what's really interesting about Danny to me, and the reason I was so interested in having him come on to Crazy Money is because he didn't go out there and chase money after having all the success in sports when he could have. He could have tried to be a broadcaster on TV and make a lot of money, or he could have tried to go out and sell real estate based on people wanting to be around him because he was a big sports star. You know what he did instead? He decided to use his career to help other people. Pretty cool, right? Yes. So he took all that success and he didn't try to use it to chase money. He did it to chase meaning, to create a meaningful life. And I think that's super interesting and exactly the kind of thing that I like to talk about on Crazy Money. So let me, I'm going to read his whole introduction, okay? Danny Werfel won the Heisman Trophy and led the University of Florida Gators to a national championship and four SEC titles. After a successful pro football career, Danny joined Desire Street Ministries, which is an organization that helps reshape disadvantaged urban communities in the southeastern United States. Desire Street provides coaching, training, retreats, and many other resources to the heroes leading change in the neighborhoods that need the support the most. Werfel today resides in, what city is he? Atlanta. Correct. With his wife, Jessica, and three children, he continues to serve as executive director of Desire Street Ministries. I'm very grateful to him for sharing his time and his insights with us today. Ladies and gentlemen, Izzy Van Ollinger, and the name of our guest is? Danny Werfel. Nailed it. I certainly look back at the different things I took in from my parents. I remember going to soccer in fourth grade. We had just moved back from Spain, and we were in Lincoln, Nebraska. So I was having my first practice in America, and, you know, soccer's pretty big in Spain. So everyone played soccer. I got pretty good at it, came back, and lit it up, had a great practice, and my, <laughs> my dad came to pick me up. Did you insist on calling it football the whole time? <laughs> That's a good, good point. <laughs> football. Football. My dad came to pick me up, and he happened to ask the coach. He said, hey, how did Danny do, you know? I imagine he was probably pretty good because he played in Spain and he's a good athlete. And the coach looked at him and said, oh, yeah, he told us he was the European champion. Like, <laughs> But what I remember still to this day is when my dad looked at me, such a disappointing face because I was kind of violating one of the most important family rules of bragging. My name is Paul Ollinger. I'm a stand-up comedian with a background in the corporate world. I hit the lottery when I worked at a small company called Facebook. I'm fascinated with money, why we're so obsessed with it, and how it makes us happy or not. Welcome to Crazy Money. Danny Werfel, welcome to Crazy Money. Thank you. Glad to be part of it. Thank you. Let's start with where you're from and what your job title is today. Where I'm from is a lot of different places. If we look at the many places I've lived, I currently live in Atlanta, in Decatur, which is inside the perimeter of Atlanta. And I get the privilege of working at Desire Street Ministries, a nonprofit. We work and support leaders in under-resourced neighborhoods, primarily in the Southeast U.S. All right. We're going to dive into Desire Street in a little while, but I want to get back to kind of where you come from as a kid. I always say where you're from is where you went to high school. That's my, so where'd you go to high school? Yeah, that's a great one. I uh, went to high school in Fort Walton Beach, Florida, moved there when I was in ninth grade. We were living in Colorado in eighth grade. My dad was in the Air Force and he got assignment to Minot, North Dakota. 
<laughs> so I was getting ready to go spend my high school maybe competitive ice fishing. <laughs> and in the last minute, it got switched, and we ended up moving down south into this like football sports mecca. Right. And moved down there in ninth grade and spent four years in Fort Walton Beach. We lived the last year in Destin and graduated from Fort Walton Beach High School. Go Vikings. And what did your folks do for a living? My dad was a pastor. He was a Lutheran pastor who then became a chaplain. So most of my youth, my dad was an Air Force chaplain. So we moved typically every three years, lived all over the country. I was born in Pensacola, moved to Myrtle Beach, lived in Spain, moved to Nebraska, and then to uh, Colorado, then to Florida. My mom primarily worked in the home, but she also was always part of the church, played the organ, played the piano, led the choir. And so, yeah, that's my folks. Like it. When you were 12, what did you think you wanted to do when you grew up? So 12, let's let's put that in a grade perspective. That's probably what? uh, Sixth grade? Sixth grade? Maybe professional tetherball. <laughs> that was big. Um, Did you stand out as a tetherball participant? Man, I mean, whatever it was, I had to try to stand out. I don't know. I'm thinking back then, love sports, love playing sports, loved all of them. But I don't know if I had guessed, I probably wouldn't have been thinking that far ahead. Well, let me put it another way. At what age did it become apparent that you had extraordinary athletic ability? Well, in my mind, probably about three. Uh, <laughs> But growing up, I remember there was a, a real key time. It's probably part of my psychological development, too. But uh, my dad was really good at fixing things. He could fix cars and always changed our own oil and fixed everything. I really wasn't good at it. And I didn't feel really good about that. And uh, I remember one time I spilled oil all over my face. And so my family was making fun of me. And I had just played a really good football game. And my dad heard my sister teasing me about spilling the oil. And he said, well, just hold on. Be careful, Sarah, because if he keeps playing football like this, he may not have to change his own oil. Wow. I was like, oh, okay. So that's what success looks like, is not having to change your own oil. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Tell me what age that was. That would have been in high school. In high school. Yeah, a little bit later than 12. Was there a point where people started to treat you differently based on your athletic ability? Probably late high school. You know, that was, I remember signing my first autograph somewhere. And, really? Uh, Yep. And actually, it was two times in the, in the same day. In the morning, I went and spoke at elementary school, and these kids were asking us for our phone numbers. Mm. So we're like, no, we can't give your phone number. And then that night, I played in a fundraising basketball game. We had the Miami Dolphins football team was there playing basketball to raise money. And afterwards, this woman asked me for my autograph and my number. She was clearly asking me for my jersey number, but I thought she was asking me for my phone number. And she goes, son, I'm old enough to be your mother. Oh, that's hilarious. But it was probably then, signed a few autographs. We were really good in football my senior year, and and you could tell. Was that before you won the state championship? Kind of going right into it. We were good my junior year, but my senior year, we were we had an exceptional season and, and won the state championship. Was it weird to you that people were interested in who you were based on your athletic accomplishment? Yeah, I think at that point, it it was probably more parallel just with like being popular in school. Mm -hmm. You know, it was kind of like you could be popular for different reasons. And by being a a good football player, that sort of puts you in that category, I guess. So my experience of it was more probably similar to being popular than just being like a sports star at that time. Right. This isn't a sports podcast. You'll have to indulge me for a second. You won everything there was to win in college. Four SEC championships, the Heisman Trophy, national championship. I don't want this to be a nostalgia interview, but we walk me through one or two of the yeah, highlights of your keep career. Going. <laughs> <laughs> All-American. Uh, what else did I miss? Oh, uh, man. Uh, well, so a couple of my favorite moments are really the bookend, the, the kind of the very beginning and the very end of my college career. One I was the backup. It was my second year, but I was redshirt in my first year, so they call it your redshirt freshman year. And I was a backup. We go to play Kentucky, and our starter threw several interceptions, so Coach Spurrier put me right in. My first play, I threw an interception. I got benched again. <laughs> so our starter went in. He threw two more. So I go in in the, in the fourth quarter. I threw a touchdown, came back, and threw two more interceptions. And so now it's the last drive of the game, and there was like we were behind by, by three or four. And for some reason, he put me back in, which I'm thankful we did. We drove down the field, and with eight seconds, I threw a, a touchdown pass to Chris Doring, who has turned out to be a roommate of mine throughout my college career and a good friend to this day. So that was sort of my first sort of moment, that last touchdown to uh, Chris in that game. And then the, the last, which 
it was clear the highlight was w- winning the national championship in my last game playing college against our rival Florida State who had beaten us earlier that year and beat the crap out of me. It was this a beautiful sort of almost like a ending to a, a good movie to win the national championship against our rival. Yeah, I asked a Florida State fan if he had any questions for you, and he said, just tell him how happy we were when he graduated. <laughs> so you compared being well-known for athletic ability to being popular in high school, but once you throw that pass against Kentucky, things must have gone to a whole new level for you as a Florida Gator. Yeah, that's where you just kind of begin to notice, I think, uh, how people see you differently, treat you a little bit differently, you know, not just autographs and and then later pictures, but just, you know, wanting to be around you, wanting to listen. You know, for me, each year kind of, it, it didn't start out with a huge bang, but just kind of grew each year. So it was a a big part of my college career, how to manage that. I try to be an accommodating guy, so I would never really want to tell someone I didn't want to sign an autograph, but at the same time, if you're trying to eat dinner at a restaurant and there's 70 people in line, right? it's difficult to manage that. I had a lot of stress around that because I wanted to be liked. I wanted people to, to see me as a good guy, but there was uh, several times looking back, I needed to say no a lot more than I did. So you'd end up spending four hours at the Red Lobster <laughs> and, it, and it wasn't for crab. <laughs> so you don't have to look too far to see many examples of young men and women who lose themselves amidst that kind of attention. What was it that kept you grounded and attached to your sense of self through those experiences? Well, I certainly look back at the different things kind of I, I took in from my parents. I remember going to soccer in fourth grade, we had just moved back from Spain and we were in Lincoln, Nebraska. So I was having my first practice in America and, you know, soccer's pretty big in Spain. So everyone played soccer. I got pretty good at it, came back and lit it up, had a great practice. And my, <laughs> my dad came to pick me up. Did you insist on calling it football the whole time? That's a good, good point. <laughs> football. Football. My dad came to pick me up and he happened to ask the coach, he said, Hey, how did Danny do? You know, I imagine he was probably pretty good because he played in Spain and he's a good athlete. And the coach looked at him and said, oh, yeah, he told us he was the European champion. <laughs> like, <laughs> But what I remember still to this day is when my dad looked at me, there was this such a disappointing face because I was kind of violating one of the most important family rules of bragging. You know, So two of our rules were win and be humble, which is – Sometimes hard to pull off together. And so kind of instill that idea that no matter what success you're having, be humble. So that was a core principle kind of in our family. So whether I was or not, I was going to act humble. So at least I got that part of it. But then in college, there was a couple of relationships that connected with that I think really grounded me. There's a an older guy that worked with the Fellowship of Christian Athletes, and he was a lawyer in town. And, and it kind of took me under his wing, and we'd meet every week. So that was a a powerful relationship. What would you guys talk about? Life stuff. Often we might read something together and and talk through that, some Bible study stuff together. And then there's a a family that was like amazing. And the the story I'll never forget, I mean, they always treated me like like a kid in their family, not like a superstar football player. And, And one year I remember I think I'd thrown six touchdowns against Alabama. We won the SEC championship. And a day or two later I'm eating at their house and I get up to leave the table and Mother just hollers at me. She says, don't you think you can leave this table without putting your plate away like the rest of us? It's like, oh, yeah. (laughs) And so it was people that held the reins in in a situation where I think definitely did and would have gotten a bigger head. And when I see other people, one of my biggest advice I give for people that are really successful at any level is I hope and pray you've got some really close people in your life that aren't a part of that world, that don't work for you or work with you that, you know, and some of my best friends, I had dinner last night with a friend who's knows me as good as anyone on the planet and knows very little about my football career. Hasn't read my book. He doesn't really care about that. And and he's such a valuable friend. How does he see things differently than other people do? Well, he just doesn't experience me as a Heisman Trophy winner football player. You know, I think sometimes when we're successful, I've got this idea. I'm, I'm considering writing a book. It's, uh, called How the Heisman Stiff-Armed Me. (laughs) The subtle title would be 
how being successful can stunt your growth as a human. Mm. And like, it's going to be a little bit funny. First chapter would be like, you're not as funny as you think. You, me? You probably are. Oh, oh, sorry. No, you, you probably mean, are. You mean one. It's a, one, somebody is You, isn't. plural. You, plural. Y'all aren't. Everybody yes. else out there. But when you're well-known, whether you're a business leader or celebrity or musician or sports figure, you know, when you say something sort of funny, people will laugh more. Sure. And so what do you, you think you're funny? Mm-hmm. You probably aren't as good a listener as you think. You probably interrupt more uh, than you think you do. And there's all these ways that sometimes when you're successful, you don't have to develop the other characteristics of being human that help to make somebody more likable and, and more successful because you were fast, mm-hmm. you know, or you were pretty, or you right. were, you know, whatever talent you kind of had that helped make you be successful sometimes can work against you. That's an interesting perspective. You know, I talked to previous guests as a guy who's a financial therapist to billionaires, and one of the big challenges they face is the fact that they're surrounded by yes men. Uh, yes, people that, as you say, their jokes are funnier, you know, their points are always accurate as opposed to somebody who will keep them honest and say, is this really what you, you know, what you're trying to accomplish here? Man, yeah, I get the opportunity through the fundraising and the things that I do to be around a lot of people with means. And and that's part of the impetus to the book is I think it's really hard to have people around you that are honest when so many of them are part of that system mm. that benefit from your celebrity and they get caught up in it and or your success, whatever that is. But man, finding a good friend that knows you and has the permission to challenge you or call you out on things, most of us, as we get successful, we don't really want that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, who we say that? we want it yeah. until they actually call you on That's something. Right. We right? love consultants who bless our ideas. Mm-hmm. Or who give you just enough advice to appear to be frank, yes. but not quite entirely. Yes. Along those lines, you know, you hear all kinds of stories about how winning the lottery actually ruins people's lives. And Rashan Salam, who won the Heisman two years before you did, took his life just a few years ago. And one of the messages he left behind that he considered the Heisman to be a burden of high expectations that followed him for the rest of his life. Are there elements about winning the Heisman that are more of a burden than a blessing? Well, yeah. I mean, I think that there are always positives and negatives to most situations that you go into. And there's certainly been some pressure, you know, a lot of talk about, well, you're not going to be able to win a national championship if you won the Heisman, or you're going to have a terrible NFL career, or just along the Rhine, uh, even beyond the football field. But, you know, there's also this, you know, the the difference between a sort of a public life and and trying to have a a real full life and being known and dealing with people knowing you and that sort of thing has created some some challenges. But at the same time, I've just seen it as such a door opener. And in the things that sort of matter to me in in my life, the things that I'm trying to accomplish that I think matter – it's been a, a huge catalyst, an accelerator to kind of get some things done. And so I, I think it is uh, it is a, as a weight to carry, but it's also an incredible blessing and opportunity. You probably get your phone calls returned pretty quickly. <laughs> People often will return my call. And uh, <laughs> it, it is interesting. I really have to often wonder when I'm talking to people, you know, do they know who I am and is that impacting how they're treating me? Mm-hmm. You know, and, and sometimes I hope it does because I need something, you know, but other times, you know, you just kind of wonder, you know, do this, does this person really like me or, or not? Or, you know, how, how's this dynamic playing out? There's a guy I know that played football at the University of Georgia and he's single at, I don't know, 42 or something like that. And I said, at what point in a date do you let it drop that you played football at Georgia? Because that's kind of a big scorecard here in Atlanta, or that's kind of a big bullet point on a resume that I think I would drop pretty early in a dinner if I were he. So if I met you on a plane, at what point do I discover that your background is non-traditional? Well, I would say probably unless it came up or became painfully un- kind to keep that information you probably wouldn't <laughs> i mean i wouldn't sure wouldn't bring that up you know if we started talking about football and, and it got into the conversation to where if 20 minutes later someone else recognized me they would feel like i wasn't being honest or something right, i yeah. might but most of the time i i wouldn't bring it up unless it made sense so you're winning sec titles you're going into the national championship you win the heisman what are you thinking about your future at this point the biggest goal I remember making was in ninth grade. 
I wanted to get a college scholarship. It was a very important goal for me. I, I thought it might be in basketball. I love basketball and was decent in middle school. Turned out to be football. So in some ways, it was like everything after that was gravy. Mm. Like I didn't have this major expectation or goal, but was pretty able to focus on whatever was the next thing to work on, you know, getting better, getting in shape, trying to get on the field. Now that you're on the field, how do you play better? How do you win more games? How do you win another championship? And then all of a sudden it's over and I have a Heisman Trophy winner and, and I'm starting to potentially get drafted. And, you know, I didn't know if that lasts a year or 20 or not, but didn't didn't have a ton of expectations, but was really feel pretty comfortable saying that I was just kind of on that journey and, and looking to see where it would go. And how would you describe those seven or so years in the NFL? Like, how did that compare to your college career? It was tons easier. I mean, I didn't play very much, uh, <laughs> so I got hit less. Um, <laughs> that's that's a side you know, effect. You don't have to manage a full load of school right. along with it. You know, for navigating the public, you know, you're kind of stuck on campus with forty thousand fans to go to class and to move around. But, you know, in the pros, you can kind of you know, drive into practice behind the gate and park and you can you can engage with people when you want and withdraw when you want. So it was a whole lot easier in that sense. You know, it was tough to not ever quite get that shot to play and to have success. And, you know, that was what I was used to. And so you kind of assume or you expect whether you'd say it consciously or not. Yeah, we're going to we're going to win and we'll see how this goes. And so I kind of feel like I never, never got to succeed like perhaps I would have wanted to, but man, I don't, I really don't have any regrets because the, the relationships I made, the people, the contacts, the connections, you know, by not getting beat up as an older person, my body's still in pretty good shape and can't say that for a lot of my former teammates that, mm. that did. And, uh, and then of course, uh, we'll talk about this at some point, but that's what led me to New Orleans to be involved with Desire Street, which is the, the organization I'm with to this day. Having read your book, there was more randomness involved in you being the quarterback at Florida than I thought there would have been. There were points at which somebody else was going to get the job and circumstances just worked out that you were going to get it. And that never popped in the NFL quite so much. Yeah, I think you could say that. I mean, I think one way to look at it is you've got to be as a quarterback or any position, but especially quarterback, you've got to be in the right place at the right time with the right coaches and the right team, the right system. And when I look at my career... Uh, high school was a dream. Mm. College was a dream. I played in the NFL Europe. We won the World Bowl. That was an incredibly fun season. And so more than almost anybody I know, I was in those spaces so often that I, I'm overall grateful. And I think you could say I never quite got in the spot that was ideal for me. So that's one way of looking at it. Another way that I think is also true is from a, a, just a biomechanics of throwing, I never really maximize my potential as a thrower. If you play golf or familiar with golf, you know that if you have an efficient swing, you can create a tons more power than even someone who's stronger that maybe just kind of muscles through it. So I just, for whatever reason, I didn't play baseball, wasn't really taught the fine mechanics of pitching. I just never really leveraged my body, my hips, my lower body to really maximize my throw. So I got really good at, at doing what I did and, and had a lot of success with it. But I do think had I been better, I probably would have, would have played longer. And how did you get involved with Desire Street in New Orleans? So when I moved to New Orleans, I because of my time in college and my time kind of as a Christian in the different groups I was with, I was seeing that time as a time to go play football, win games, but also there's always a bigger purpose than whatever my vocation is. That's always kind of been ingrained in my mind. So I was actively looking for something, mm. not knowing what it might be. How old are you at this point? 97, so 23, I guess. Yeah, 23 years old or so. And moved to New Orleans and found, or it found me, you could say several kind of random, unrelated things sort of led me to to this young organization called Desire Street. It was rated the worst neighborhood in the country by HUD, second largest public housing project. A guy from Georgia, a white guy named Mo, went to seminary. I know him. <laughs> Do you? No, I'm just kidding. Okay. Uh, he went to uh, there and started this organization, this ministry, in like the most difficult place possible. And I was blown away by that and just wanted to go see it and 
and meet him, and and that's how it started. And what kind of work were they doing? So at the time, they were primarily doing a lot of after school programming and tutoring, summer camps. They had started a, a church, and then they had just got a, a three acres and a warehouse, so they had their own own property. You know, I showed up and we're playing basketball and just having lots of fun. And then we do a Bible study and just hanging out and hearing the, the stories of the kids and the things that they went through was just traumatic for me. It was like, how could this happen a few miles from where I'm playing professional football? This is the kind of thing I'd think might happen in a, a third world country. And so there was this disconnect, troubling disconnect that my life was so different. And the valedictorian at the high school there usually didn't pass the ACT. Mm. So it's like, wait a minute, you, you, how could you be the, the valedictorian and, and the school system is so bad that you can't even pass a basic college entrance exam? So it was just sort of that motivating, what can I do? Let me be a part of this. And, you know, over time while we were there, I was volunteering. We started a school of our own, a small school, and started some housing programming and helping people get jobs and started a medical clinic. So that was sort of the the DNA of Desire Street was to kind of become incarnate in one specific neighborhood and work with the residents there to make the neighborhood better. And how do you make the transition from pro ball player to full-time nonprofit leader? Well, I was volunteering through all my seven years. And kind of after my seventh season, I was still training and hoping to get signed again with another team. And every day I would drive down our street in New Orleans, and in the mornings I would turn right when I got to the highway to go practice football. And then then in the afternoons I would come back by and go the other day, which would have been a left turn to go to Desire Street. And what sort of happened was every morning I would get to that intersection where football was right and (laughs) Desire Street was left, Mm -hmm. and it just got harder and harder to keep turning right. It wasn't like a I have to do something. It was more like I, I wanted to. You felt called to I turn think left. so. I think so. And, you know, it's hard to say, but the, I was I was thrilled to get this opportunity when I retired and started working there because if, you know, it can be, it sounds very ungrateful to say, but if you're a backup or a third string quarterback, it's, you don't do much. Mm-hmm. You know, every other backup is part of special teams and part of other things, but and so you really, once the season starts, there's even not even a lot of practice reps mm. to get. So your job is just to not gain 50 pounds. Your job, yeah. Be, <laughs> eating Cheetos in the locker room. And be ready to go. Um, <laughs> pay attention to what's going on and be ready to go. And so... Does Werfel I, even know any plays? Yes. <laughs> that chili dog, though, he's loving it. <laughs> right. But so when I retired and went, I was like, so much opportunity to, to make a difference, to do something, to change things. You know, I'd sit all the time thinking of plays that I thought would work and no one would want to listen to. and That's the spur you're in you. Yeah. I mean, I remember when I was with the Packers, Brett Favre was the starter, and Matthew Hasselbeck and me were the, the backup. Jeez, what a squad. And me and him would just sit up. We like had a whole playbook design that would have been awesome, and we come, but no one would ever listen to us. So it was like, at least we had each other <laughs> to uh, affirm one another. And, uh, and so it was really enthralling for me to actually go somewhere. And, you know, the first week, we didn't have weight room equipment, and we had a sports team. So I was able to back to, you know, when a Heisman guy calls, people answer their phone. Within a few calls and a few tracking people down, we got a whole weight room equipment donated, and we had a weight room. Like, that was awesome. Yeah. What was the transition like personally for you? Was it a big adjustment? I think because I left to do something. There was something else I really wanted to do, and I left to do it. And part of that meant being immediately in another community, immediately with with teammates, immediately with a purpose and a vision. I think that really helped me avoid some of the the struggles that so many athletes go through. You know, I think the last study I heard was 85% of NFL players within three years of retiring are either uh, bankrupt, uh, unemployed, or divorced. And it's... I believe it. I believe it. I mean, I just talked with another buddy who... It just went through it, and it was just like your entire identity, your entire life. Your so if you make it to the NFL, your your pocketbook, everything is changed in an instant. And psychologically, it's just really, really difficult to kind of go through that. I think I avoided some of that because I had something to do. I think the other thing though was, you know, my relationship with competition. 
is a very interesting one. And how so? Well, it's it's a pretty strong one. <laughs> and when that kind of officially left, it, it was hard to like, you know, well, do I retire that or do I have to try to beat my kid to death in checkers or whatever it is? And so trying to, you know, I've kind of gone through different phases of trying to set my uh, mantle or my, my competition drive on the shelf like the cleats. And then other times I'll pick it back up and go crazy. And I, I'm just starting to have a balance. I think that they're, they're able to turn it on and turn it off and try to direct it in certain areas or not. But uh, that was definitely something that, that took me a while to manage. Sometimes you meet people in nonprofits, you find people that are a little bit sleepy, maybe not cut out competitively for the corporate world. So how do you channel competition? It seems to me that, that having a little bit of an edge in competition could be massively advantageous to getting stuff done in a nonprofit world. It is. You have to balance it again with sort of the idea of, you know, partnering and I don't want to get a grant and the other group doesn't get a grant and they go under mm. type of thing. So you, you've But you want to get that grant. But you do want to get the grant. <laughs> um, and you want as much money as possible. You, you need it. So, yeah, I, I don't know. I'd have to think a little more how the, the competitive piece completely fits in with Desire Street. You know, I found some other avenues and recently I just started playing in this real high level professional flag football league the last couple of years and oh, I wow. really loved it. That kind of came out of nowhere. I, was, I think it, I think you might have an unfair advantage. It's actually professional flag football. Michael Vick played in it. Oh seriously. Uh, Chad Johnson, we've had they've had a got a lot of guys involved. The first year they had a million dollar prize for the winning team. So they mm-hmm. fished out a lot of folks and uh, and a half million dollar bonus if you blow your ACL on <laughs> camera. Yeah. Yeah, no. They don't want to pay for your injuries. That's the whole point. <laughs> Do it and not get hurt. But uh so that's been fun. You know, I've always played golf. My dad, you know, back to where things come from, you know, my dad's a crazy competitive guy. He won the over seventy racquetball tournament a couple of years ago and that's you know, awesome. his, he had surgery on his right hand and now he's playing left-handed <laughs> that's great so when you're a quarterback your statistics are reported to the world and i was going to say in the paper but i want to attract a millennial audience so i'm going to say they're on the web they're so when you're a quarterback your statistics are reported to the world in real time and your win-loss record goes down in history how do you measure your success in the work at desire street there's a sense of immediate feedback that as a competitive guy is very helpful in sports. And so in some ways, I think you have to create some of your own benchmarks in the nonprofit world. And, you know, hopefully you have a good board of directors and a good team where you can, you can do that. So you don't sort of just get caught and we're kind of doing the best, best that we can. You know, I think for me, our goal now and how our, our mission has shifted was in New Orleans, we were running an, an urban ministry, working with kids and families, over time we found was that, you know, the, the original goal was to then start another one in another neighborhood and another one and sort of build this almost like a franchise model. What switched after Katrina and when I became the director and we began to expand was we realized there were already people living in neighborhoods doing heroic work. And on average, most of them didn't last longer than five years because it's incredibly difficult. We could talk for hours about, I think, it's probably one of the hardest jobs I've ever seen anyone try to take uh, to, to run an urban ministry in, a, in an under-resourced neighborhood. And so we switched our model to basically we're, we're finding these heroes and then we'll come alongside them for five years, help them develop their leadership, develop their team, let uh, help develop their boards so that they can be thriving and sustainable. So when we see the difference and is happening in a neighborhood because there's a thriving leader versus a neighborhood that's sort of back in distress because the leader had fallen and there's mm-hmm. no more organization and the school stopped and all the whatever goes down. That's incredibly rewarding. And the difference is instead of seeing your stats the next day, you got to kind of look at the long haul. Mm-hmm. So it's, you know, five years from now, 10 years from now, and that's that's a little harder to do, but it's incredibly more rewarding. And what outcomes are you measuring? What we measure is the health of the leader and the organization. So, you know, we do different burnout surveys and we want to see our leaders less likely to burn out. We're looking at some financial accountability and how are they managing their money and different standards. Are they doing that well? How functioning is their board? How is their budget? And then, you know, is the neighborhood connected with what they're doing and to what extent are they impacting the community. You know, marriage is a, a big piece of 
everyone's life that's married. When you're talking about different jobs, you usually focus on whoever's doing the work. But so often the way someone is effective is, is impacted greatly by their marriage. And then when you get into a ministry and an urban setting, the stress on marriages are so, so hard. So we've had a, a lot of opportunities to help pour into marriages. We just led a marriage retreat for all of our partners that was incredible and enriching and helpful. That matters if that marriage falls apart in many ways. A lot of things go downhill for a ministry and in a neighborhood like that. And what services are they providing for the communities they serve? There's a little bit of variety in that. Um, so most of them have an after-school program and summer camp. That's kind of a staple youth program that most have. A couple of them are actually schools. So we support leaders that are running schools for, for the kids in their neighborhood. Uh, a couple of them are housing programs where they're working with people to be able to, you know, there's a we could talk for hours about sort of how gentrification and how these different cities, all the neighborhoods where poor people have been living, where a lot of the social services are centralized, now are becoming cool for investors to buy and put in markets and condos and people are moving in, which on one hand is great, but the downside is all the neighborhoods, residents are getting Squeeze, displaced everywhere out, yeah. and now there's no central help. So being able to provide housing, get some housing before the prices go up, a couple medical clinics and some churches. So those are the type of neighborhood programs that are happening. And then we work with the leaders that are running those programs. Do you guys work hand in hand with any local governments? And if so, what kind of government support has been the most helpful to you? And if not, what kind of programs would you like to partner on? So the biggest interaction we had was after Katrina, we got a FEMA grant to rebuild our community center in New Orleans. And that was a, a really big project. There were times when I would have probably wished we hadn't started because it got all complicated, but it ended up really well. We built a beautiful facility there that's serving the neighborhood back in the original spot on Desire Street. So that was very successful. Typically, we're flying under the radar from the, the city governments. You try to have good relationships with the city council in particular mm -hmm. to get zoning for if you're going to rebuild a community center. And sometimes that's more challenging than other times. You know, there's, in, in our opinion, a really successful thing happened that in Grove Park here in Atlanta. I mentioned earlier, this gentrification thing was happening, and all the people that live there that were part of the, the neighborhood ministry and all the kids that were going to the programming, like every month a family or two from the program was having to move because they were losing their housing. Mm -hmm. And through some advocacy from some of our partners and their board, just released just yesterday that the city put a moratorium on new buildings there until they can kind of settle down and figure out how they can do it in a way that also honors the low-income residents as opposed to just let the market drive it, which ends up usually hurting those on the bottom. Right. How big is Desire Street? Well, big is a great question. We've actually expanded our footprint and shrunk ourselves. There's one of my favorite verses in the book of John. John the Baptist is talking about Jesus, and he says, he must increase and I must decrease. So our model, when I took over, you know, we had a huge budget. We had 60 staff. We were running a school. We had all the programs. We had a, a monster amount of money to raise every year. And every year we've been shrinking ourselves and building up others. So mm -hmm. we're a pretty lean, a lean team. You know, we've got eight full-time staff, and then we have a lot of uh, part-time consultants that, that are part of our team that, that help as well. We've got 11 current partners all around the southeast that are sort of core neighborhoods that what, we're focusing on. What cities are you in? In Dallas, New Orleans, a couple neighborhoods in New Orleans, a couple neighborhoods in Montgomery, Mobile, uh, four neighborhoods in Atlanta, in Lakeland, Florida, in Orlando, Florida. And then there's several other cities where we've, we've worked in the past that, that aren't current partners. So it's pretty exciting. Where do you want to take the organization? Well, our goal is to develop thriving and sustainable organizations. So one of the main things we have to do is make sure we're thriving and sustainable. And so we're working on a, on a plan moving forward. You know, I think we're probably going to be working through our strategic plan to say, hey, that maybe in the next five years, our goal was to develop 20 different neighborhoods, thriving and sustainable organizations in 20 different neighborhoods. Want to be aggressive and growing, but also not so aggressive that we become 
stressed and burn out ourselves. <laughs> um, so there you go. Physician heal thyself. Yes. So personally, you've had many ups and you've had presumably some downs in your life. One of the things I read about is you lost everything in Katrina. What was that experience like? Yeah, we lost everything in our house. Probably the most noteworthy experience around that for us came kind of, we had one son at the time. So me and my wife and my son, we were able to leave the city and like everyone waiting to see what happened. And where'd you go? So uh, we ended up going to Natchez, Mississippi. Mm -hmm. We were a little ways away. We were safe and just kind of waiting, like what happened? And then like the rest of the country, we watched those first aerial shots of what looked like a tsunami somewhere, except like, wait, that's our target. You know, this this parking lot's underwater. That's our grocery store. And mm. when we saw the the first time we kind of knew what happened to our house was we saw a picture of our neighbor's house behind us, and there was water to the roof. And we had a one-story house. So, like, that was the sort of the moment that we first realized, like, everything we had was underwater. But what sort of... The, the context of that moment was very much shaped by the fact that at the same time, the mayor of New Orleans was saying thousands of people have probably died, tens of thousands perhaps, mostly in the Ninth Ward, which is where Desire Street was, and all of our kids that we work with and families were spread out everywhere. You couldn't get in touch with many of them, and those who you could find, they couldn't find their families. So there was this huge sense of loss of life and loved ones that fortunately didn't turn out to be near as bad as they predicted. But at that moment, so for me, it was like, yeah, we may have lost our stuff, but I had my wife and my son with me. And so it was this like, you know, we talk a lot about what's the difference in a want and a need. Mm. And, you know, we're we're really good at that when it comes to teaching our kids or trying to teach our kids. Mm -hmm. You don't really need that. You want that. But I think we're probably all really bad at that. Probably our country and us as individuals, probably more than any country in the history of the world. I mean, we, we want a lot of stuff and, but what do we really need? And that moment, man, I just, I had what I needed. My wife was okay. My son was okay. Everyone else, I like, who cared that the stuff we, we had was probably ruined, but we were, we were okay. One other really memorable uh, context was going back to our house the first time. And and what would happen is if your house was flooded, you or a group of people would hopefully be able to go what they would call gut a house or mud a house, which is basically you take everything that's ruined, get it out of the house as quick as you can, pile it up on the street in hopes that you could salvage the frame mm-hmm. so it would be a cheaper rebuild. So then eventually the city would come and pick up all the trash, but that was you know accumulating. So driving in... You're driving on these streets and there's these piles of trash, almost like, you know, like stands of a parade, except it wasn't people cheering. It was just piles of trash that eerily was someone's treasure a few weeks earlier. And it made me really think, like, how much of my life am I spending on things that are one day going to be trash? And what's going to sort of last? And uh, I, I keep having this picture of one day... Somebody be walking through a pile of trash and hit their shin, might curse and reach down to pick up something that's 40 some pounds and they pick it up and they're like, oh my gosh, what is this piece of trash that's a Heisman trophy? <laughs> and who is Danny Waffle? Like, what is this thing? Danny Waffle. And like, you know, one day it's probably going to like, I don't know how long from now. Right. But like, how much of my time today, how much of my money today, how much of my talents today have I? put forth in something that one day will be trash and how much is in something that I think is significant that will matter. Well, you've made some pretty clear career choices that seem to indicate that you have a better handle on that than a lot of people do. I mean, you could be monetizing Danny Werfelness and Heisman trophy resume bullet points, selling insurance or in in a lot of different ways you know, whatever, hawk and memorabilia or whatever. I mean, do you feel like, do you believe you're consciously happier doing this work that you're doing now than you would be if you were out there chasing a buck? Yeah, I definitely, when I go to sleep, 
And this is t- like, I had a friend one time say, you know, when my job's getting tough, sometimes I just want to quit and go work with you. I'm like, what do you think this is easy? Like, no, this is some really <laughs> You're hard a nonprofit. It must be stuff easy. that we do. Um, and so there's a lot of pain mm. involved, but just the idea of being a part of something that matters. I mean, we're comfortable. We have, we have the things that we need. We're very well taken care of. Uh, and so, you know, why keep chasing after that, that scoreboard? That's a scoreboard idea of, of what you're making that never quite seemed like it was the ultimate scoreboard to me. There were other scoreboards that, that seemed to matter more. In golf parlance, it's a sucker pin. Mm. Man, that's good. You're going to end up in the trap or the water. That's really, really good. So what scoreboards do you pay attention to? Well, on the, on the positive side, you know, the ability to connect with someone on a real level matters to me. Mm. Um, when someone is hurting, the ability to somehow be a part of something that is encouraging to them, whether it's we're having a conversation and you're sad about something, or whether it's a more systemic struggle where there's a group of kids in a neighborhood that don't have a chance to get a good education. And and by helping provide a school, their entire life trajectory is going to change because they're getting a quality education. So, like, those things really, really matter. Probably on the lower side, kind of the, not to get too psychologically vulnerable, but, you know, it seems like there's three typical ways that people sort of try to make sense of the world. One is sort of through getting power, you know, one is sort of through possessions, you know, and one is sort of through getting affirmation or I think that I'd fit in that third one. So, you know, if if somebody is a firm, if, if I've pleased the teacher, if I've pleased the coach, if I've pleased the wife or the board member, those, those things have mattered too much to me. So part of my growth as a human being is to recognize that and not let that be a false pin either. You know, right. That can be a sucker pin. Affirmation can be a big one. Well, and it's one that we've been conditioned to pursue since we were in kindergarten, right? Like you get a sticker for doing what the teacher defines as being the desirable outcome, right? Mm-hmm. So it's hard not to, but I, I try to think about it as like, one, what's worth doing today? And if I'm seeking affirmation, and I, I love it when people say, hey, I enjoyed your podcast. Sure. I mean, it's great. I love making a big crowd of people laugh uncontrollably. That's fun, which happens occasionally, sometimes accidentally. <laughs> uh, this podcast has turned out to be, people come up to me and say, hey, it means something to me. I don't know what it means, but like these conversations are helping me think about my own life differently. And I'm like, oh, wow, that's, I would have said when I started is like, I just wanted to be funny and for a lot of people to listen to it, but like it actually means something. It's makes me feel like, well, it's worth the work that I'm putting into it. I think the the goal with these sucker pins is to realize that they're not everything and they're not nothing, you know, mm-hmm. go win, like right. make money, yeah. but don't get suckered into thinking that's going to make your life better. You know, go help make people uh, life better get affirmation and who doesn't like affirmation but it's when those good things become the ultimate thing that i think we get and can get cattywampus <laughs> cattywampus that is a fort walton beach term technically speaking <laughs> yeah it's big, big on the beach when i was 25 i was jealous of the guys who had money and fame but at 50 you realize that life is long hopefully it's long and that everyone has ups and downs over time what advice would you give a young adult who has the world telling them that they're awesome Probably that advice. That was good. <laughs> that was great. Write it down, Danny I Waffle. Don't, I don't know how I could, uh, I could do do better than that. Yeah, I, I think though, you can't you can't skip that first part of life. You know, I think there's a, a lot of people that I know, and I think you know, there's different ways people allude to it. You know, middle age or middle age crisis or, or whatever. But there's a lot of people I know in their 40s or 50s that are, kind of really coming to some some tough questions, and. You know, as you, as you kind of move, some people use moving from just trying to be successful and whatever it is to trying to be significant. Or, mm-hmm. you know, there's different language I think that's really appropriate for that. But I, I think there's – you can't skip skip the phases in life. They all have their purposes. And I think, they're, you know, you've got to sort of charge into the world. To, you've got to kind of learn how to build um, build something before you start realizing what might matter more than what you built type of thing. And so I, I think – I'd stick with your advice. Yeah, I don't have anything better than that right now. But it's 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 a long game, 
You know, the thing so I try to teach my, actually, I'll just go with this. The most proud I was of my, my 16-year-old son in a while, you know, he's kind of getting caught up in wanting to be a superstar on social media, and he's gotten to do a little modeling, and, you know, so he's watching all these, like, super rich I've people. I've seen old pictures of you with hair. I mean, like, I can see that where that comes from. <laughs> he's got really good hair. I, I <laughs> For now. For now. No, he this does. is, he's got the kind that's going to stay. It's good. He got his mom's hair. Oh, that's but, good. uh we were visiting some friends and they have a, a really nice house and I had actually had to leave town while we were visiting. So he stayed with them over the weekend and they got busy. So he ended up spending a lot of time alone and he's, he's extroverted. He doesn't like being alone. And, and he said this comment, he goes, Danny, I was at this beautiful house the type of house I would dream of being in. And I was bored because <laughs> I didn't have people with me that I liked. He's like, you know what? When I grow up, I don't think it matters how nice my house is. I, I want to, well, maybe it matters a little, but I really want to make sure that I'm like, yeah, if you can value relationships and you can take care of important relationships and make people matter, that is going to serve you well. Speaking of relationships, who are some of the role models that shaped who you are today? Well, clearly my parents, you know, there's several amazing stories. I'll summarize the one is uh, I was trying to write a book about what might make me successful, you know, Werfel's Way or something. And during that process, we had Jonah, and I was thinking of one unique thing I've noticed about myself that I thought about when I was trying to write a book on how to be successful was this voice in your head. And what I remember about the voice in my head was I could literally remember what I said to myself at some key moments in my life, like wanting to win the blue ribbon in the 100-yard dash. I can remember in first grade over and over repeating this, Danny, you are so fast. You are so like I can hear it still talking to myself, and I remember wanting to cheat on a test, and I began to well, I was doing some research and see what this girl thought about an answer, and this voice said, "Danny, you're smart, you're a good kid, you don't need to cheat." So I didn't at least then, and I remember playing basketball in high school and just had to play against this guy that went on to be a guard in the NFL, and I was blocking him out, and for weeks before this match, it was this game. It was this Danny, you are so strong. So what I thought was my book was going to be, how do you talk to yourself? And the way you talk to yourself will determine your life. So it was this great idea. And then we had Jonah, my first son, and my mom came to help with the little baby, which was so sweet. And it all changed one morning because I was walking by the nursery and I heard some things in the nursery. Apparently my mom got in there and was holding my son, this little baby boy. And I heard things like, Jonah, you're such a good boy. Yeah. You're so smart and strong. And I was like, I've heard that before. And mm -hmm. 10 minutes later, she's still in there. You are such a strong boy. You can open your eyes. And, and then 10 more minutes later, I go by and she's like, I love you. You're such a good boy. And like, I started to cry because it wasn't my voice. It was my mom's voice. It was my dad's voice. It was the coaches and pastors. And ultimately that's what I think was the voice of God speaking through them that before I threw a touchdown before I threw an interception, before I got a good or bad grade or made a good or bad decision or was successful in business or not or desire street to, before any of that, I was important and special and loved just, just because. Mm -hmm. And that's like the core of, of my faith, that there's, there's this love that permeates if we're open to receive it. And so not a day goes by where I don't recognize that impact that my parents had and those along the way, you know, my high school football coach, I can walk you through all the, the lectures he gave us and by chapter and verse, they are still ingrained in my head. Uh, one of my other high school coaches just read his obituary today mm. and he was impacted more lives than probably anybody I know. And uh, I just, he was such a hard, he drove you hard, but he was so fair never forget one time we got in trouble and he's like, I will run you till I get tired. <laughs> like, wait, so you get tired. You're not running. Wait, that's, that's right, the yeah. point. That's funny. Now, Coach Spurrier meant a lot to me. Mm -hmm. um, and some different mentors along the way have just really, really poured, poured into me. I've always tried to find someone older that I could just sit and share with and have them share what's on their mind. And, and all those folks have really impacted me. Service seems to be a through line to your life. Tell me about the Werfel Trophy and how it got its start. About 15 years ago or so, a group of men from an organization in Florida came to me and said, hey, we want to start a college football award for community service. And I'm like, that sounds great. And like, we want to name it after you. And I was 
I mean, it sounds a little bit humble, but part of it was just I thought there's too many awards and just didn't mm. want to add another award. But uh, the guy who was the director of the Heisman contacted me and he said, I think you should do this because college football could use this. Mm. So we did. We started this, uh, the Werfel Trophy, and, and every year we've gotten nominations this past year, about 100 that basically have their resume as a football player and a student, but primarily it's their community service, and that's what we vote on. And we honor the athlete that kind of wins that trophy. And as we grow, we're hoping to to get more sponsors to be able to tell more and more of the nominees, the finalists, and other people's stories because there's some heroic work happening. And typically in sports, we kind of hear about the guy who made a bad choice or the guy who got hurt or the you know all those things when we miss a lot of the amazing stories of what these young men are doing. Are third string Division three players eligible for this? Because that's what I was for a year. Actually, I'm glad you're here because you've you've gone through a quite a vetting process, and you're going to be our first <laughs> Division three third string winner of the Werfel Junior Trophy. <laughs> Division three third string is uh, technically Division nine, by the way. Is that is exponential. <laughs> That's exactly right. That's, so, who have been some of the more notable recipients of the Werfel Trophy? I mean, most notable is probably Tim Tebow. Sure. Uh, won it years ago. We've had Sam Macho is playing in the NFL. He's won it. You know, the, the cool thing is that we really aren't going after the big name. It's it's really about the bio and what they've right. done. Uh, yeah. This past year, John Wasink from Western Michigan won it. Uh, and just a fantastic. Drew Tranquil won it last year, and he's he had a great rookie year in the NFL. And some of the guys have gone on to play. Some of the guys have gone on to do other things. But most of them come back every year for the ceremony, and it's truly a brotherhood of of really great men. Sounds like it. Both an honor and a little bit of pressure on you to have that named for you. I'll be honest. There's been a few times I've been trying to decide some decisions in my life, and I'm like, you know, man, I do have this award named after me. Better Maybe I shouldn't do that. <laughs> That's right. I guess we won't go to Vegas this week. So before we wrap up, I want to ask you a couple of semi-football-related questions. If you were a blue-chip recruit out of high school today and you absolutely couldn't attend University of Florida, what program would you want to be a part of? I would go... I can't, well, that's hard. Like I, I was ready to answer, and then I was like, I can't answer that question. Okay, for all the Gator fans out there, I wouldn't play anywhere. Boom. If I can't go to Florida, I'm not playing. There, there uh, you go. Other than that, I'd I'd probably go to Oklahoma. Oh yeah, what's I going think, on in Oklahoma? Well, Lincoln, that's Lincoln Riley. I mean, they've they had two Heisman winning quarterbacks, and then a, a runner up or uh, one of the top five this past year. I think they're doing phenomenal things. Ohio State is doing great work with the quarterback up there. So. It'd be Oklahoma or Ohio State. All right. Biggest failure or disappointment? If I could have one moment back, mm. it would have been my sophomore season. We were playing at Auburn. We were ahead 10 nothing, and we we're, we're on the four-yard line. We are about to go ahead 17 nothing. I misread a signal from Spurrier and mm. thought, <laughs> why would he call that play? That's so dumb. But I was a sophomore, and I wanted, didn't want to, you know, I was coachable. That's what he used to say about me. Yeah, Danny's he's not that talented, but he's highly coachable. Right, there you go. So I don't know if that was a compliment. But I, I ran the play through a 96-yard interception return for a touchdown. We got beat like 38-35, and I ended up losing the job for several days. So if I could have one moment back, I would love to, to have that, that signal back, and we'd probably win that game. So that's one. He called a button hook at the Subaru or something like that? Just about. Yeah. It was a button hook. No, he called a great play. Actually, the play he called was wide open for a touchdown. <laughs> you um, just didn't run that. I play. just didn't, didn't didn't run it. So that that was a that was a big a big disappointment. How about in your broader life? Probably one of the hardest things I've ever had to do in my in my professional career is when we closed Desire Street Academy. So part of Desire Street Ministries was we ran a private school. And a school after Katrina moved to Florida, and it was this amazing story of how this school stayed open, and then it moved to Baton Rouge. And we really hoped it was going to become a, a school in Baton Rouge for kids there, and it was just too expensive. We didn't have the right leadership, and so it became apparent we had to close the school. But for a lot of the families, it was like the, the lifeline for their kid. Mm. And so I remember getting in front of, I don't know, a couple hundred parents and having to deliver this news. Uh, and, you know, when, when people are angry, they, they're they looking for someone to take that anger out on. And so I, I recognize that a lot of the treatment that was happening there really was directed at me, but it was also concern for their kids. And so it was, 
it was just really sad. I mean, just to go through that process. Um, one of my mentors, I think, correctly shared that you know when you have a a vision to move forward, not every part of that thing is going to be successful. And sometimes those things, you know, that get they have to get scaled back, create space for something new to grow. And I think mm-hmm. we would never be where we are today had we kept operating and funding that school. But closing it was, you know, there's some kids here even in my office that were were, uh, were part of that. You'll see them as you walk around. But just heartbreaking time for me. Mm. And since you already covered your most exciting play earlier in the interview, let's talk about the accomplishment in your personal life you're most proud of. I would say my family. Most things that I've applied myself to have come pretty easily. And I've been very successful at most things. And if, if I wasn't successful at something, I could usually just in my arrogance say, well, if I'd at least applied myself, then I'd have been good at that. But being married and, and having our kids and raising our three kids, it's been very challenging because uh, I've put a lot of effort in it. And it doesn't hardly ever go the way I think it should go. And so it's been very, very humbling. And uh, we've got some amazing kids and I, and I love them so much, And uh, but it has not been easy. I'm going to move this one up because what you just said relates to the next question we ask you, but should college athletes be paid? Tough question. Very tough question. It's one of those situations where I see something that's happening that doesn't seem or feel right in terms of the way college football has been, the amount of money it's generating, but then all the solutions that I'm hearing don't quite feel right either. Ironically, I just got off the phone with Herschel Walker yesterday. I was calling him to see if he would be a part of our fundraising golf tournament the week of the Florida-Georgia game, so he'll hopefully be coming down for that. How's his golf game? Does Herschel play? Last time he played in our tournament, he had broke his right hand MMA fighting, so he just golfed left-handed, and he was good. (laughs) It was like, my gosh. Uh, That's what you get when you do a 1,000 sit-ups every day. Man, man, yeah, we were at the Nissan Heisman House commercial, and he changed his shirt, and I've never seen a group of men oodle over a guy like all of us were looking at him. And he's 60, right? Something like that. He's absolutely incredible. But he's being tasked uh, on the national level to help think through that. And he's meeting with governors. And so he he was asking me questions about that, about that yesterday. I I don't, I don't know the right solution, but it does seem like something needs to change. So uh, that's, that's my most politically correct, but also honest answer. I understand that I'm putting you on the spot, sort of. However, it is a complicated issue, and there's very good arguments on both sides of it. How do you, at this point, define success? A huge part of success for me now comes down to sort of being who I am created to be, as opposed to trying to be who I think I'm supposed to be. So, if Tell me the difference between those two things. Well, I mean, there's so many storylines we're given as kids and so many things that we think we're supposed to act a certain way or you think you got to make this amount of money or do different things. But for me, trying to be the most authentic version of who I am is part of that journey to be successful. And and again, I might even use a different word to, to to be significant, to be dialed in. And what I found is the more effort that I can truly let go of some of these false narratives or ways that I've tried to relate uh, that aren't necessarily the core of who I am, the much deeper my relationships are, the much more insightful I am into the people that I'm around, the much better friend I can be and husband and father. So I'm trying to be as absolutely present as possible, which is which is pretty unnatural for me. I'm just so used to being whatever needs to happen, just put on that and do it and be efficient and effective. So that would be one. Second, for me, success has to involve how my family's doing. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I to be successful everywhere, but have your family fall apart. I, I think is really, unfortunately, all too common. You know, it's it's scary because you're not the only one in your family. You can't control everything and right. how it goes. But to really make that a priority that you're going to be be present and take care of your family, and I think. Ultimately, it's it's the lives that you impact, the, the way that your existence on this planet somehow affects other people to where they're moving closer to who they are, they're moving closer to being healthy, to being loving, to being the, the ideal of humanity that I think most people would 
would agree would agree is and um and if we're playing ping pong i'm gonna kick your butt like, <laughs> like, uh, I, so I, i'm still wrestling with that like i really want i really want to just serve you unless we're competing that i want to destroy you <laughs> That's fantastic. So you're a faith forward guy. What do you do on a daily basis to keep yourself healthy spiritually and physically? Physically, if it's ingrained to always be me moving and whether that's the least jumping on an elliptical for a little bit uh, each day or at the most, if I can go get a really good workout in, you know, if it's something you enjoy doing, if it's a, a racquetball or tennis or something like that, it's even better. So just stay in movement. I think for me, a couple of things that have become incredibly important, it's kind of a new trend. A lot of people are using the word mindfulness mm -hmm. uh, and, and meditation. There's a version of that that I think is a little more Christian centric called centering prayer, but it's very similar. And what is centering prayer? It's very similar to just mindfulness. You're, you're trying to just pay attention to your thoughts. And then as you recognize a thought, you have sort of a, a, a sacred word that you would say in your mind as you let that thought go and then sort of kind of reconnect yourself with the, the, the deeper part of your being or the, the God or the Christ that's sitting there with you. So it's really, in a sense, just sitting still and noticing your thoughts, letting them go uh, as an act of, of volunteering, letting those things go and you, you know, 10 minutes sometimes or 20 or 30. And that has been incredibly impactful. In There's, what way? Kind of like a watershed. It's almost, it's hard to say in what way. I think it's sort of, life becomes a little slower, become less reactive. I can be a little more uh, centered. Part of that process for me involves, and that's through that and, and, and going through different counseling and having mentors and pastors. But part of it too is emotional health of really recognizing what emotions I'm feeling. Like that's not natural for me. Like mm. I, I would normally feel what I decided I needed to feel to be effective. <laughs> and so therefore, like I'd know what you're feeling because I needed to know what you were feeling to be effective. Right. Uh, but my feelings were always like, who cares? Right. And they, I was well, always you're a fine. man, Danny. I mean, that's part of it. That is part of Come it. On. So I was really good at that. But to recognize my, what I'm feeling, I think, it, you know, I used to never think I was mad. Mm. Like I never really felt felt anger. I could look at my whole childhood and not really think of but a few times I was angry, which is now looking back, it's kind of absurd because you get angry a hundred times a day. And if you're angry and you don't know it, that's even scarier. And so I think so much of how we live our lives, we're reacting, we're not really recognizing how much our emotions are, are moving us as opposed to paying attention to them and then choosing how you want to react. And right. so one of the things I do, back to your question, is I'll journal Here's my journal, and I'll get a sheet. In I'm here. going to open it. It's a, a dear diary. Dear diary. So here is a list of hundreds of feeling words. And uh, oh, wow. So what I did. They range from open, happy, alive on one side to interested, positive, strong on the other. And those are the pleasant ones, and the unpleasant ones run from angry, depressed, confused, to afraid, hurt, sad. Oh, interesting. So in, in every journal article, I'll do a feeling check. So like this was you know, January 16th. Mm -hmm. And often I won't just be able to sit and tell what I'm feeling, but when I read through the words, I can, I can recognize it when I'm reading through the words. Mm. And so that just, just taking the time to write down how I'm feeling has been incredibly helpful to be self-aware. And so that, that's been... A big part of my journey. So I would say centering prayer or mindfulness, journaling. Um, I'm in a small group of guys every Tuesday night. We're authentically showing up and sharing our struggles and helping guide each other through what we're going through. Community and alone time. That's great. So in your life, in your public life today, you're probably most associated with University of Florida Gators and the Heisman Trophy. What do you want your name to mean when you die? And what do you want on your epitaph? I was just thinking through this, going through an exercise of like, what are, what would describe you at your core? You know, what would be your personal mission statement? The PG version <laughs> would be <laughs> win, be humble, serve others. Mm -hmm. You know, the, uh, the, the more 
aggressive version. What, what's the average age of our listeners? 77, I think, is the average age. Okay, the, the PG-13 <laughs> version is kick butt, right? Uh, be humble, serve others. But those three concepts of tackling with incredible intensity that which you think is important, competition or, or whatever project you're going at, like almost obsessively, do your best, win, mm-hmm. succeed, like go for it. But at the same time, value being humble and serving others. And probably the biggest satisfaction I get now is when people come up to me, and for years it was always, I loved watching you play. Mm -hmm. And now it's starting to be, man, I love watching you play, but you know what? Even more so, I love what you're doing now. Yeah. That, That feels really good. Yeah, that's cool. Well, Danny, this has been a real treat for me. Where can people find out more about you and Desire Street Ministries? I've got my first ever personal website, dannywerfel.com. That just went up. but uh, I'm going to spell that because it's not the easiest name to spell. Or say. W-U-E-R-F-F-E-L. Good for you, man. I've well been done. doing some research. Dannywerfel.com, but I'd prefer you go to desirestreet.org. Uh, you can find out all the things that we're doing. Uh, we may have a partner in a city near you where you could participate. We do a big fundraiser, Florida Georgia Week. So if there's Georgia fans or Florida fans, come Hang out with Herschel Walker and Vince Dooley and Steve Spurrier and me. Is there a donate link on uh, Desire Street? Oh, there's all. If there's not, we're not doing something right. Um, but it's the Desire Cup. Uh, you can uh, sign up for that. Lots of ways to get involved. But again, more than that is, no matter who you are, you know, this year Joe Burrow won the Heisman and he made a comment about the homeless shelter in Ohio and things took off. And I was so excited. And I also wanted to say, yeah, but you don't have to be a Heisman winner to use your influence to make a difference. Every single person that's listening right now, there's there's a way you could do something today that's small that would really make a difference. And to value that, to intentionally do that, to think about that, I think is a, is a great thing. So whatever, wherever you are, uh, do something that helps someone else, especially somebody that's in need. Great way to end it. Thanks, Thanks a bunch. Man. That was really fun talking to Danny. Izzy, did you like that interview? Yes. <laughs> you haven't even heard it yet, have you? You'll, you'll listen to it later because it's a good interview with no super adult topics and no bad language. Daddy didn't say any bad words during that episode. Anyway, hey, folks, if you like what we're doing here at Crazy Money, sure would appreciate it if you take one moment to scroll down to the bottom of your app page and throw us a few stars, ratings, write us a good review. Sure would be helpful. As always, I am grateful to my guest, Danny Werfel, to my co-host today, Miss Izzy Van Ollinger. Thanks for your help, sweetie. And to my editor, Mike Carano, Mike, thanks. Make me sound smart.